Great. Okay, where were we? I want to welcome you all here to another one of this wonderful series of lunches. And my name is Ken Goldberg. I'm a professor in the College of Engineering in the School of Information here at Berkeley. I want to also welcome all of the people who are tuned in over the web to join us today. I want to make a couple quick announcements. One is that the I4 Energy lunch or lecture on Friday is, not, is going to be postponed, so stay tuned for further information. There is something special tomorrow, which is the Big Ideas competition. The posters, the student winners, are, are going to be, um, or the finalists, I should say, are going to be out on, in the lobby starting tomorrow at 3 o'clock with posters. So please check those out. And I also, there's a number of interesting upcoming events. I'll, I'll tell you about on the 25th, next Monday, the Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium is going to be hosting Raf D'Andrea, a phenomenal robotic sculptor uh, from Switzerland. We're, and on Mar May 2nd, we're going to be hosting Christopher Alexander, the, the, the legendary architect and philosopher of architecture. And on the 4th, we're going to have Bill Joy who is a Regents lecturer who's going to be speaking to, to he's, he's one of the founders of, Co of Sun Microsystems and is a great, is also legendary in the field of computer science. Those are all coming up and then I'm going to give you one shameless personal um, uh, uh, producer promotion which is that I have an installation that just opened at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco that is a responsive sound installation and it will be up through the end of July. So. With that, I want to, oh, and, I, and the last thing is that we are be, try, being more and more ecologically minded, and so the lunch that you have there, everything can go into the compost area, except the aluminum, if there is any, and the cookie bags. We're working on those, but thanks to people like Jason over here, we've been moving more and more in this direction, and now the, the water bottles are fully compostable. So mm. enjoy them and compost them. So with that, I want to introduce our, our speaker today. It's a delight to, 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 to have her here. Ellen Bromberg is a, is a professor at the University of Utah. She's a renowned performance artist and filmmaker. She, is, she actually had spent some time here in the Bay Area. She lived here in the decade of the uh, of 1980s. A very interesting and tumultuous time. Um, she's, she's got a huge, wonderful list of accomplishments. She has a 2006 Guggenheim Fellowship. She won three Izzy Awards, Isadora Duncan Awards for, for dance um, that are given out here in the Bay Area. And she has a, a Pew National Dance um, Media Fellowship. She's also had grants from the National Endowment from the Art, of the Arts and the Soros Foundation. She has designed video for stage and installations. Uh, both in her own work and collaboration with other choreographers. She, as I mentioned, is a professor, associate professor at the University of Utah and is founding director of an international dance for the camera festival there and has also designed a graduate certificate in screen dancing, which I'm hoping she'll be talking a little bit about today. She has a, as a, a she's one of three choreographers who's going to be featured in the Berkeley Dance Project which is directed by Lisa Wymore, that will open at the Zellerbach Playhouse this Friday. And it will open at 8 p.m. and runs through the 23rd. So information on that is at tdps.berkeley.edu with information on the ticket prices, et cetera. So please join me in welcoming Ellen Bromberg. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And to follow up that shameless plug, I have... Um, Business cards is actually how they advertise these events now, which I think is really great, about the upcoming performance this weekend and next weekend. So if you are interested, I will put them here. It has all the, all the details. So I would like to thank Citrus for the invitation to speak with you today, uh, the Townsend Center for providing uh, funding for my residency here at UC Berkeley, and I would specifically like to thank Lisa Wymore of the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies for inviting me to be uh, in residence at UC Berkeley, which has been a fantastic uh, period of time. We've really enjoyed working together and I'm looking forward to our piece premiering this weekend. I've been thinking a lot about how to bring my work to you um, as a dancer um, and choreographer and now media maker. Um, I, I try to understand how I even got to this moment that I'm talking about technology. My life experience, would I would never have guessed that I would end up here in this particular context and I actually find that sort of 
nonlinear pathway, somewhat interesting, um, as we all end up in places I think that we don't anticipate. But when we look back, we understand the logic behind it. So um, I would like to share with you a little bit about that pathway, then show you some of the work that I've made over these 10 or 15 years, little excerpts of ideas. And um, if there's time, I'd like to show you some work of a colleague, some colleagues at the University of Utah who are doing interesting work with dance, video. Uh, actually, it's really a computer animation technology. Um, so I wanted to start with a frame that could, an inclusive frame, one that would bring us together sort of at this moment. And the largest frame I could think of at this particular moment was the idea of creativity, which I think is something we all share. And um, those of us who are fortunate enough to live a life in which we can pursue our interests, we, we know what a wonderful life that can be, to be followed, uh, to follow our curiosities. And so um, I think of creativity as a way of seeing and being in the world, seeing possibilities within one's environment and experiencing that deep curiosity. We then develop skills to explore the questions that arise so that answers can have a form. For those of us who have the opportunity in this life to follow those threads, we are really, I think, really uh, very fortunate to be able to, to have that as a driving force within our lives. Somehow we find our medium, we develop skills, uh, perhaps even virtuosity, um, become comfortable with that medium or the context in which we can ask those questions. And whether it is in the arts, humanities, sciences, engineering, or medicine, pursuing answers to those questions becomes the driving force of our lives. So as um, was stated previously, my background is in dance, but it wasn't merely uh, the desire to perform dances that, that in inspired and interested in me, interested me. At an early age, I understood the metaphors inherent in the embodied experience, and I realized that I could physically learn about important life experiences through the process of learning how to dance and how to dance with another. These realizations were quite profound, and while they may seem less profound, it's important to kind of bring one's attention to them because as a, a young dancer, it very, very often we don't get this kind of, or as a young person, we don't get this kind of education. As a dancer, I understood how it felt to be fully present, sensing and aware of the space around me. Most of the time, we're very frontal. We go through our lives this way. Every now and then, we will do this. And we do this more with Facebook and and, and in cyberspace, but in, in the real space, and of course those, those, those spaces didn't exist when I was younger, um, dance provided me an opportunity to engage in a three-dimensional awareness. I understood how to be centered and to feel truly the ground beneath my feet. So again, these metaphors of what standing on firm ground becomes a metaphor of our lives. It also becomes a really important strategy for being able to dance. I learned what trust meant when I would throw my body across the space and trust that a dancer was going to be there to catch me. I understood what trustworthiness was when that same dancer expected that I would be there too. I understood what whole body listening was, whole body learning, and what responsibility meant, what community meant. I learned about discipline, tradition, and transcendence. It was ultimately the metaphors within the form that had the most profound importance to me. When I became a choreographer, it was because there were things I wanted to understand about the art form. How does movement convey meaning in and of itself? How can bodies come together to explore and express both emotional and highly abstract ideas? What are the conventions for reading movement, and what are the many levels of experience an audience member can have in its viewing? What is the nature of live performance? These were the questions that drove me when I was living in the Bay Area in the 1980s. And I had a couple of opportunities during that period of time, to, uh, which I'll, I'll share with you, that really changed the course of my work. But I think the things that I'm talking about uh, not knowing your individual backgrounds, my assumption is you're coming from perhaps sciences, technology, maybe 
the humanities, I, I'm not quite sure, but these, these metaphors themselves become very important, certainly when working with uh, graphic elements in computer animation and a lot of the technologies that are being used now for visualization in the sciences. Um, so the physical knowledge then gets extended into the digital realm. So in the 80s, I was fortunate enough to be invited to create two works for KQED. That was back in the days when they actually had commissioning funds, which I think died out a long time ago. Um, and I was invited to create one new work and then to restage a work that was ultimately performed on PBS, which was a very exciting experience. It was the first time I really looked at dance, the moving, feeling, sensing, three-dimensional body, through this frame, through the technology of the camera. And I found that incredibly exciting. In shooting the dancing body, I was able to observe that the frame moves. And I'm giving you this information as a way of sort of leading you into this process of ending up in virtual worlds. <laughs> but um, having started on the stage where you have this static proscenium, the static frame, once you bring dance, once you see dance through the frame of the camera, you're then able to change that frame and have a million choices about how you're trying to capture this movement. It allows you the opportunity to create metaphoric spaces that don't necessarily exist on stage. It gives you three-dimensional access to the dancer's body with no stable front. Front, side, up and down, all are up for um, confusion and creation within the camera. It gives us access to the intimacy of a close-up of the body where a gesture or a turn of a head can, become see can be seen as a very powerful gesture within the, secret the sequence of a dance that would normally be lost on stage. One can override gravitational forces with the camera. Time becomes plastic and fluid. The use of filters, entrances, um, and effects enhance the qualities of motion and space. And most importantly of all, it liberated dance from the architectural, historic, and social constraints of the proscenium theater. We can now watch it at home. We can see it, and now, of course, we can watch dance on our, on our uh, iPods and our laptops and e everywhere. So, so uh, everything has changed. Everything is new. The metaphors of the camera began to supersede those of the dancing body. Some of them were literally sharing a point of view. When you're on stage, everybody has the same viewpoint. It's one side. But with a camera, we can more specifically guide the viewer into having a very specific point of view. Bringing an idea into focus, the metaphor of focusing, was, uh, became really important. Working with a wide or tight frame, dissolving the body, deconstructing time and space with the jump cut, implied events taking place off screen, we can happen upon events that are already occurring with a camera, whereas most often when you're on stage, it's what you see is, is what the information is. So working with the camera and being introduced to technology as a way of redefining and reconstructing, if you will, the body, became a very powerful uh, moment for me. So um, I was at that time had been working with uh, a company, a couple of different companies here in, in um, the Bay Area. And one of uh, them was called Henry Harris Green. Uh, John Henry was a very well-known dancer. He had danced with Margaret Jenkins. I don't know if many of you follow dance in the Bay Area, but uh, Margaret, uh, Margaret Jenkins, a very well-known and um, important dance maker in the, in the Bay Area, has been for many years. And John was one of her dancers. Um, he and I worked together for a number of years, and at some point in the 90s, he asked me if I would make a dance about AIDS. And I thought that was actually kind of an interesting question, because usually when a dancer or an artist says, I want to commission a piece from you, they say, make a piece for me. Do what you want. But John was very specific about how he wanted this dance to go. And at the time, I was very busy, and I said, well, uh, you know, let me think about it, call me back. Six months later, he called me back, and he said, I would like you to make a dance for me about AIDS. I would like a dance that uses video so that the dancer can perform the dance as close to his death as possible, so that video would replace his real body. 
And that was John's way of letting me know that he had AIDS and um, that this was basically his final performance. Interestingly, at that point, I had worked with video as a choreographer. Um, I had never really worked with video on stage, and so I asked uh, Douglas Rosenberg, who some of you may know is a, a, a very well-known dance, video dance maker, installation artist, and scholar. I asked him to join me on this project, and what turned out to be uh, what originally I thought was kind of a difficult question became a profound experience over the course of making this piece for two reasons. One, the final piece was contingent on the death of the dancer. We were anticipating eventually making a documentary out of the piece after it was finished. So, and we couldn't really begin that process until the dancer had, until John had passed. Um, the, that sort of like a crossfade between the real body and the video body was taking place on stage before our very eyes. And every time he performed the piece, there was less of him and more of video. And in many ways, that whole project, which spanned maybe six years, and he performed it um, a number of times in three different cities, and his final performance was two weeks before he passed. So that actually became sort of synonymous with my own sort of transformation from being a, a, mainly a choreographer to being somebody who is really interested in how the video can, I don't want to say replace the body because it can't, it just redefines the body. So I thought I would show you a short excerpt of this piece. It was called Singing Myself a Lullaby. And um, give me one second here. And it's a very short excerpt, but it gives you an idea. You know, we didn't do a sound check, so. Uh, okay. While I'm on stage in the environment that Ellen and Doug and Jack and Victor and so many others uh, have created for me, I feel like I can deal with the disease in a managed way. It's very hard to see, I'm sorry. It's... Oh, where I are they? The Over here? I the Medical Thank Field you. of the Back Hospital when I got to Fort Dix. I thought we were going to Germany. Oh, I just did. It Thanks. turned out they had just come from Germany. We were on our way to Vietnam. When we would go to a village to pacify it, the older people would sit on their haunches and cry, beg, picket flies, like agitated monkeys. Now, where was I? an 18-year-old from the malls of the San Fernando Valley, supposed to pick up the understanding to deal with something like that. Eventually, the process revealed so that as I disappear, all of the elements will be balanced. And so we started that process almost four years ago. And uh, it's been grueling at times, um, painful, but very rewarding. So it was, it was a very real, um, I guess I turned this back on. I got it. I think I got it. 
uh, way of feeling, I don't know if you could see clearly how his body was diminishing through each edit, um, to sort of feel the power of the video image to replace his physical body on stage. And by the end, um, I, I just felt like John had given me such an incredible gift that this, this opportunity to learn about the way these ideas work was transformative for me. So that sort of began my search for ways of learning about video, and I became a dance media fellow and studied shooting and editing and all of those, those kinds of things, and, and now teach and, uh, and have now designing media myself for stage performances, which hopefully you'll come see this weekend. Um, so another, uh, I, I'm looking at the time, and I want to just make sure we have time for discussion afterwards. Uh, I, I then worked in uh, an environment, an interactive environment called the Intelligent Stage at Arizona State University. Uh, it was the Institute for Studies in the Arts, and they commissioned artists to make work in these really amazing spaces. I have a very short little excerpt of a piece that was designed uh, through where, where video, sound, lights were all controlled by the dancer. So the space became active. One of the things about dance that is so remarkable is in the experience of dancing is the way you feel space around you because you are listening pretty much with, with all of your senses. And so to be in an environment where the technology actually allows you to do this and something happens, and you do that and something happens, you feel in a way that the technology itself is mimicking uh, the aliveness of the space and allowing things to happen that one could never even imagine when I was learning to dance. So this is a very short excerpt of a piece called Falling to Earth and uh, the audio is very hard to hear so you can kind of tune that out but the, the relationship between the dancer and the sound is, is something that I just wanted you to see. It's only 30 seconds. I hope it's, I hope it's, the sound isn't too irritating. sensors in the space and the composer has uh, placed uh, possibilities within those spaces and the dancer then goes into those spaces and essentially is creating his score as he's dancing. That was just a, a very exciting uh, bit of research following that kind of curiosity. Um, and then came the opportunity to work for an organization or work or found this sort of organization called ADAPT, which is, called, is the Association for, the, for Dance and Performance Telematics. And with the internet then, we were able to transmit dancers from one location to another and bring them together to create a, a unified dance that doesn't exist really anywhere other than on the screen, but it's live. And one of the things that was interesting for me about that was you're still working with the frame of the camera, but you're working with the aliveness of the, bo the body. So um, let me just see the time that we have. This is a little sort of demo of what we did with ADAPT. And this was really, uh, I guess, when did we do the early, well, late, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And the technology was, there was no Skype, there was no iChat. We talked to each other on cell phones behind the scenes <laughs> so we could try to get things set up. And um, uh, there was a delay in video. So it took, there was like an eight second delay between uh, locations. So the dancers were essentially working with artifacts of themselves as they were moving. So it was a very interesting challenge of time and space. And um, we worked with five different universities and I'm just going to show you a little bit about that. So this idea, whoops, don't want to do that. Um, I won't show you the whole thing. 
As a matter of fact, I'll just show you a short piece of it. And I want to just apologize at this point for the gender cliche of men behind computers and unclad women in front of the camera. But this is really what was happening. Oh, this is the wrong one. Well, this is a different one. I'll show you this. So this is a different one, but this is two, uh, this is Florida State and University of Utah. This is the merging of the two locations in one screen. And so you can see the way they are collaborating. So we're basically compressing space. We had live music in Utah and the dancers in Florida were dancing to our music. I'll just play this again because it's short. Of course, if I... Ah, okay. All right. So there was a number of years where we really worked to try to create these opportunities for distance collaboration. There were limitations, of course, but uh, for, the, for the viewing audience and for the dancers themselves, it was actually quite moving for them to really feel like they had a relationship with people who were across the country. And there were times when they would meet up in other places and recognize each other and feel like they knew each other already. So, you know, of course, now that seems like no big deal because of the way we live online with Facebook and everything else, but at the time, it was actually quite, um, quite something. So I want to close this particular show and tell with a piece that is more recent, and um, it's called Collapse. Um, suddenly falling down, and it is, uh, it was a huge collaboration, and I'm going to, um, hang on one second, let me, this was a, a huge collaboration with choreographer Della Davidson, uh, script, or uh, writer Ed Gable, Oliver Kralos, who's a brilliant computer programmer at uh, UC Davis, Louise Kellogg and Don Summer from um, the Department of Geology and Ge Geophysics, and Michael Neff, who's a computer uh, artist or computer programmer um, at UC Davis as well. The, the dramatic strand, this was really a play with dance and media. And the, the, uh, Louise and um, Don had come to us um, they are, they are responsible for the Keck Cave, which is, you probably all know what cave technology is. Are you familiar? Is anybody not familiar with cave technology? Yeah. Okay, it, it is, uh, it's basically an environment in which you can put on the goggles or some other device and be in a completely immersed three-dimensional world. And they have been using this for the sciences for quite some time, but they were really interested in seeing how can we make this merge with the arts. And so, uh, they created uh, this opportunity for Della to create this huge piece. They actually brought in um, 3D uh, polar polarized screen. The audience came in with glasses. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But they were able to create a three-dimensional immersive environment in, at the Mondavi Center for the Performing Arts. And the, the technology for this came out of LIDAR scans that were taken by the um, U.S. Geological Survey, and uh, LIDAR scans are, the, are laser scans which go into an environment and through infrared basically create data out of all of these natural disasters. So uh, mudslides, uh, just floods, all of these things can be captured in a way that allows scientists to look at them from all different directions and learn about the way the, the way our constructed environment responds to these natural disasters. So when they showed me uh, these images, I, I knew that this was going to be the visual material for this piece. The piece was based on Jared Diamond's piece, piece called Collapse. And um, the, drama, the, the writer says, the dramatic strand in Collapse was derived from the first chapter of Jared Diamond's study of the fall and disappearance of civilizations. 
Diamond starts his book with a study of Easter Island and a speculative but informed account of the forces that drove the islanders to absolutely denude their island of trees, which they used to move and to hoist the giant stone moas, the carvings for which the island is now famous. Collapse, the dance theater piece, homes in on a fictional last couple on a version of Easter Island as they debate whether or not to cut down the last tree in an act of religious homage. homage. So that's kind of the basis for this huge collaboration. And in it were used uh, motion capture technology with infrared lights, and I'll show you where that is. Um, and again, this sort of 3D immersive environment. So what I'd like to do is I want to bring up the, um, the data as it was first, when, when you see the data, it's basically just this clump of information. Just, it looks like a blob. But as you move into it, and when you're in the, the cave itself, you basically point and click, and you, you can go up and around and inside and around, it's, it's phenomenal. So one of the things that I asked Oliver, if we could basically design a virtual camera that would move through this data set so that it could move in concert with the choreography. And uh, this is what he did. So here is the, um, the data as it, as it looks by itself. And of course, it's hard to imagine. Well, it's not so hard to imagine what this looks like in three dimensions. But I'll just show you a little bit of it. I had this downloaded. Let's see, what, here we go. All right, so you can see it from a distance and it, um, it's, it's basically, uh, it just looks like a blob. I'm going to forward it a little bit if I can, if it doesn't. And this circling uh, was, is part of the um, entrance to the piece as well. And as you get closer, again, imagine this in, in uh, three, three dimensions, you can see you can start to see the, the kind of landscape that this is. Trees, homes, this was a mudslide in Southern California. And it brings you into <clears throat> the actual homes inside. So you can imagine this with, with glasses on, how it, it really is. 3D, and again, you know, here we are with 3D movies out now. It's, it's really maybe no old news, but at the time it was um, quite unusual to see something like this in three dimensions. So I will stop this now and show you how we combined these elements in, um, in this piece. This is the polarized, uh, polar, polarized screen right here. But the images show up on the whole backdrop eventually. And it looks like a pointless painting.
This is a motion capture uh, section in which one of the dancers is controlling these scans through um, placement of her hands. So when the hands are closed, it blocks, and when the hand is open, the infrared cameras are picking that up. And this is, um, again, finding data that matches the ideas within the piece, and of course, the tree being a very important metaphor within the whole piece. This is another motion capture section where he's sort of looking, drawing home, and how does home dissolve? How do we destroy our homes? And what is the decay, both within the technology and within the ideas within the piece? Concluding, I just would like to say that um, I feel as if we follow these threads, uh, we don't know where they lead us. And as a dance artist, I feel that working with technology has really helped create a much richer metaphoric environment for the work that I make and um, allows me to really participate in contemporary culture in a way that I find really quite fascinating. So thank you. If you have any questions, we can happily talk or... Yeah. So do we have any questions for our speaker? Any, any questions? Yes. Can you, can you say a little bit about this screen, I'm sorry, can you say something about the screen dancing yeah, yeah. Um, idea and is it a new genre and how, what are examples yeah. of it? The screen dance uh, certificate is a collaboration between film studies, the Department of Film Studies and Dance and it's open to filmmakers animators, digital artists, and dancers to uh, explore the nature of human movement on the screen and, and making either dance films or just utilizing the knowledge gained from that process to do other kinds of things. So it's a year-long certificate and it's a residency of yeah one year at the University of Utah. Thank you for asking about that. Yes? So at the beginning of your talk, you discuss how important learning the metaphors are as you become a dancer. So if you are a young dancer learning how to dance and you have that experience of your feet on solid ground and you grow into some of these new technological avenues of experiencing dance, how does that change that experience of feet on solid ground? How does the, the metaphor change when you start to incorporate the virtual world? Right. I think it's a really great question. And and I think, in, in a way, the, it's that relationship of extension and support. You don't extend yourself beyond what you have the understanding and support of. I mean, yes, you can, but there's a risk involved. So for me, the, entering the virtual realm is really a function of how grounded I am. <laughs> I mean, not that I'm not uh, neurotic like the rest of us, but... <laughs> But I can sort of understand that. The virtual is an extension of this world. It's not a replacement. It's an extension of. And so if, I'm, if I understand that, then I'm really free to roam in, in um, really interesting ways. So, yeah, thank you for that.
Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for this. Yes, you're very welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for coming.